In this video, I will show you how to conduct a design review for a medical device. In fact, I will be taking you through what a design review is and what you should be doing when participating in a design review. I've also included a link to a design review template that you can download for free on medicaldevicehq.com. Hi, I'm Peter Sibelius, the founder of MedicalDeviceHQ.com, and I've worked with developing medical devices for more than 20 years. This video comes from my online course, Introduction to Design Control for Medical Devices, that is available on MedicalDeviceHQ.com slash design control. I hope you will enjoy this video and find it useful. Okay, so let's start by looking at what the design review is. The design review is a documented, comprehensive, and systematic evaluation of a design to evaluate the adequacy of the design requirements, to evaluate the capability of the design to meet the, the requirements, and to identify problems. The most common way to perform a design review would be to have maybe five to 10 people gather for a meeting and go over the design, the requirements and status in general. Depending on the amount of available information, this could typically be a meeting that lasts between one and maybe four hours, but there are really no specific rules to this. So are design reviews valuable? Worth the time? Sure they are, or at least they should be. Stopping and taking a step back to see that you are doing the right things in the right way is an extremely valuable thing to do. You'd be surprised to see how often we just continue running in a given direction without really questioning what we are doing. Design Review is an excellent forum to ask yourself exactly those kind of questions. Now, before getting too far, let's clarify a few things. Design review is the term coming from the QSR. In the ISO 13485, a corresponding term is design and development review. In this course, I refer to it as design review because I am lazy and design review is shorter term than design and development review. Now, design review isn't the same thing as a steering group meeting. Design review focuses on quality. That is the design's ability to meet requirements. Steering group meetings may also include questions relating to quality, but they should also focus on the budget, resource situation, commercial requirements, launch plans, and other things relating to the business. Ideally, design reviews are kept separate from steering group meetings. The reason why I bring this up is that there are quite a few companies where the difference is not entirely clear and people are sometimes a bit confused on this. So how many design reviews should you have? The ISO 1345 and quality system regulation says that you should have design reviews at suitable and appropriate stages. There's actually no mention of any specific number of reviews. Therefore, we'll have to assume that the minimum number is one design review. Now, for most projects, having just one design review is not something I would recommend because I do not think that it is appropriate or suitable to have just one unless it's a really small project. A more reasonable number would be a handful or so of design reviews. If you have a very complex product and many teams are working with different designs and develop processes that or have individual design reviews, there might of course be even more reviews than a handful. And that is okay, as long as the design reviews are held when suitable and at appropriate stages. The design review uh, reviews must also be planned, meaning that we cannot have ad hoc design review meetings. The planned design reviews are supposed to be found in your design and development plans or procedures. If you're planning a follow-up design review meeting, you may plan that in the record of the previous design review meeting you held. It is still considered as planned. The participants that uh, are present on the design review meetings shall be relevant and competent in the area of the design review, and that should not come as a complete surprise because it's a general principle that for everything we do in the medical device industry, you should be competent for the job. Nevertheless, it's emphasized that Representatives of all functions concerned with the design stage being reviewed should be present together with any specialists needed. From a US point of view, there is a requirement that states that there shall be a person that takes part in the design review who does not have direct responsibility for the design stage being reviewed. Many times you will find that this person is referred to as an independent person. If you ask me, finding an independent person is a tougher job and having someone who is not directly responsible for the design stage being reviewed as it is expressed in the QSR. But that's how it's usually uh, named or phrased. Determining whether a person is independent or not is not an exact science, but it would not be okay if you have a 
design review, uh, which examines the design and development inputs, and the only ones present at, uh, at the review are the ones that have been developing the design and development inputs. As a general principle, the independent person is also expected to be at least as competent as the people who have done the work that is under review. In a small company, you might have to hire an external consulting resource to find someone who is not directly responsible for the area being under review. The requirement of having an independent reviewer in design review is one of the few differences between the US requirements compared to the ISO 13.5 that is used in Europe. And the independent person is only mentioned in the quality system regulation from US. During design review, it's very likely that you will find issues or even non-conformities that need to be addressed. Therefore, your design reviews should have a method in place to record the necessary actions that you have identified as needed. And you have to maintain records of those actions. In its simplest form, this would be to add the actions to a task list in the meeting, minutes of meeting uh, of the design review. A more advanced way of doing it would be to record action items in a validated Kappa system or other similar database. Either way, the important thing is that you have a method to deal with the action items and maintain records of them. Now we've covered a number of mandatory aspects uh, or requirements of design reviews. One thing which is not an explicit requirement, but sometimes quite useful and common, is to use checklists for the stages you go through in development. In their simplest form, they could outline just which documents should be present at a certain point in time. If that is the only thing you check, I regret to say that that would be a very minimalistic approach to design review. But by all means, it doesn't hurt to do it anyway. More valuable is if you have checklists that address, for example, completeness of design and development inputs, that all necessary actions have been taken in design transfer, or that you thought about not repeating mistakes that the organization has previously made in design and development. Now, I've seen really nice examples of such checklists where there are very granular questions to check, for example, that you are not using more different screw lengths than you have to in the design. Simply good engineering judgment questions to help you create a good design, good requirement specifications, or good design transfer results. As mentioned before, you need to maintain records of any open action items from the design review, but it doesn't end there. You need to maintain records of the design review in general. The most apparent way of doing this would be to create minutes of meeting and record things that you would usually find in the minutes of meetings, such as when the meeting was held, who participated, what was discussed, any action items as mentioned before, and a sign off from one or two people that were on the meeting. Quite often, organizations choose to let the independent person that was mentioned before sign the record from the design review. I've never seen anywhere that this would be a specific requirement, but it's very commonly done, and which means that it's a sure way of avoiding discussions with the FDA and other auditors. Many organizations would also have a template for the review records. So if you haven't done a design review before, check if there is a template. If you're lucky, you'll both find details about agenda and a template for the records. Now, I hope you found that really useful. What is the most common pitfall in the area of design review and how can you avoid it? Now, before getting to that, please tell me what you think about design reviews in the comments field below. Are they dead boring, waste of time or really good to have? Do let me know. If you want to learn more about design control, please register for my online course, Introduction to Design Control for Medical Devices through medicaldevicehq.com, where I will take you through the process of how to develop new medical devices and maintain them in an organization where design control requirements apply, covering both European and US requirements. I'll also introduce you to a number of tools which will help you work successfully and efficiently with design control. Then what is the most common pitfall in the area of design review? Based on my experience, the most common issue is poor or lack follow-up of action items. It could be, for example, that a project team identifies a number of tasks that need to be done within a certain time frame to continue the project going forward. They write out the things in the review record with people being responsible for doing the job and a closure date. And this date might be just a few weeks into the future because ideally the things should have been done already in the first place when the design review meeting was held. After the meeting, people go back to the regular work and are stressed and under pressure, which is why they are more likely to spend time on solving what they consider to be real crises or sticking to deadlines rather than following up on things identified during design review. 
So the action items are left unaddressed, or people actually do close the open action items, and that's a good thing, but there is no follow-up showing that they actually did complete them. When an auditor comes to the company and starts looking at the design review records and finds the open action item, she or he will ask, so what did you do with that action item? And if there is no record showing that the action item was closed according to the plan, if you didn't get a non-conformity straight away, you would at least be looking at a good candidate for one. And that is something we want to avoid. So how can you address this? Well, my advice is that if you have open action items from a design review meeting, which you will have most of the time, I propose that you schedule a follow-up design review meeting within the time frame where you have the deadlines. So if something needs to be closed in two weeks, you have a very short session planned to follow up within those two weeks to say, yes, the open action item uh, was in fact closed. Or if they weren't, you can document why and create an updated plan. The follow-up meeting can be a really short session. You could do it electronically or over phone. Just make sure you create records of the meeting just as you would for a regular design review meeting. That was all on design review. I hope that by now you're well prepared to attend a meaningful and value-adding design review meeting that will meet regulatory requirements. And don't forget what I said. If you create open action items, remember to close them in a timely manner and keep records of that. Thanks for watching and I look forward to sharing some more valuable learnings and information and insights with you soon. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel.